Um, so I want to welcome everyone to this month's meeting of the Houston Functional Programming Users Group. And uh, this month, um, we have Paul Bigger um, uh, speaking. Uh, he is the uh, former founder, uh, CEO, developer of Circle CI, um, and he is now uh, developing the dark programming language. And um, I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Paul to what dark is, why we care about it, uh, how we developed it, and anything else he wants to talk about. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you folks for having me. Um, you were doing intros a few minutes ago. So my, my functional language uh, intro is uh, for, I've been a functional programming language um, developer for 12-ish years, if we don't count what I did in college, um, closure at CircleCI, and then at Dark, we've done um, everything from, we've done Elm, we've done Camel, we've done F Sharp, Rescript, Rescript when it was called Buckle Script, lots of lots of different things, and have sort of settled in. Well, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk more uh, a little bit later about where we've settled. Uh, let me figure out how to get the screen share. Okay, um, looks like people can see the screen share, but I can't. Why can't I? Okay, well, um, great. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, about Dark. And Dark, uh, I, I've actually started calling it Dark Lang in the last couple of years, but it's a very hard habit to get out of because Dark is like one nice little syllable. Um, but Dark is a functional programming language, and I call it a functional programming language for the cloud because it it's, doesn't really exist in the same way that lots of programming languages do, which is you install them on a server. We'll talk about that more uh, in the future. What, what we'll be talking about is what, why did I make Dark Lang? Uh, I'll show you a demo of it, talk about the main features, talk about the functional programming aspects of it, and then talk about a backend rewrite, which was from one functional language to another. So it's kind of interesting. Um, then talk about where, where Dark is, and then a new secret exciting thing, which uh, you can still refer to, I don't care. Um, but you know, it's not going to be announced for, for a couple of weeks. My, uh, my background, um, before, before all this, uh, obviously, I was um, at CircleCI. But before that, uh, I did a, uh, a PhD at Trinity College Dublin in compilers and static analysis. And then since 2017, I've been the CTO of Dark. Um, and since 2020, I've been CEO. And that's that's a whole story that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, OK. So now, why, why, why did we start? Why do we start building Dark? So when, when I was at Circle, um, I found it like it was, it was very, very difficult to build internal tooling. And it's just like, any time that you want to build some internal tooling, it's 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 not like it's not easy to build things in, right? Applications are are things that are built in clouds, and and there's like tons of like different tooling and, and complexity around it. So to build anything, you know, we we would have to staff up, up a team. It has to become a project. There's maintenance. There's just a lot of ongoing stuff. Um, and the, the word that, that I use for this is, is accidental complexity. And you might be aware of accidental complexity. It's, a, it's discussed in the Mythical Mad Month in, in, this, um, in this article called No Silver Bullet, which is like pretty, uh, pretty influential. Um, but it's also like a term from, from Aristotle. The, the, there's the accidental complexity, which is sort of the bullshit that you need to do to build your application, which Aristotle obviously had a lot of problems with. Um, and then there's also the, the essential complexity. And the essential complexity is the real thing that it means to, to build an application. So in terms of software, the essential complexity is just like you know, receiving data, processing data, storing it, querying it, sending it out to, to third parties. Um, this is what we actually want our software to do when we you know, build Docker containers that we put onto Kubernetes and run through a deployment pipeline and write Git commits and, and all that sort of thing. But, you know, a little bit 
you know, that, that's sort of like the, 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 the theoretical essential complexity, but the actual essential complexity of an application. You know, I want to do something like tell, tell the application that the user presses send message and then the message is actually delivered. And so the uh, even if we lower the essential complexity to, you know, something that's just like this, there's another layer beyond that of, of um, essential complexity, which is, you know, the thing that the, that the developer actually wants. So if we look at how we're actually developing things today, this is the, uh, a couple of people in the audience mentioned DevOps, you're probably feeling a little bit chilled down your spine right now. This is the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, Cloud Native Landscape. And what this is, is just like a list of all the icons, and this is from 2019, uh, so it's not even it's not even up to date, um, all the tools that exist in the cloud native space. So if you're building applications in the cloud, which you know, majority of us of us are building applications in the cloud today, these are the tools, the, the, the sort of areas that we need to consider as part of our, as part of building. And none of these are the essential complexity of our applications. These are the, um, these are the tools that we need to do in order to build the essential complexity in our code base uh, that we then need to use this to get into uh, into production or, or getting it in front of our users. So that's kind of one aspect of, of the accidental complexity. The other accidental part of accidental complexity um, that, that I like to think about is the is the CI CD system. So the process of getting code from our machines where we write it into production where uh, our users are able to use it. Um, and that's CI CD, DevOps, you know, infra as code, managing, releases, all, all, all this sort of thing. And what we see here um, is a typical CI CD pipeline. Uh, where you make the change, you run some tests, you commit, you push, you go through a like CI CD run, maybe multiple times after code review. And then when you merge it, you go through it all again. And then it goes into, uh, you know, gets put into a container and the container gets deployed to a container registry. And then there's Kubernetes and, you know, just like all these different steps. Um, and the interesting part of it is that once you get to the end, you know, you, you if you if you are doing sort of modern practices of deployments, maybe you did it with a with a feature flag. Um, you know, at the end you get to go back and remove that feature flag, and then it goes through you know the whole thing again. And so this is you know a lot of accidental complexity, and that complexity that people do not really want to do when they're thinking about like, oh, what does the user need today? What does what does the tickets that I wrote in Trello say? What does the, the product manager require? And what, what does a user actually need? Like, you know, what they don't need is, is you know, a Kubernetes to be, you know, updated in a nice little way or, or whatever. So let's, let's quickly show you how we do it in dark. Um, and, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a yeah, uh, a darklang um, application that that has never you know never existed before. Just just create it as an ether, um, and we're going to create just like a hello world application. Um, so we'll just make a HTTP handler, and we'll just return the string hello, uh, and we'll open that in a new tab, and you can see the URL there. Uh, I'll zoom in a bit, um, but you can see there's a uh, URL here that you can go to, you know, open your phone or whatever, go to paul-hfpug.builtwithdark.com slash hello, and you can hit this, you know, this thing that is live on the internet already. Um, and uh, the the idea here is obviously this, this is a language that like, you know, it exists somewhere here, um, but it doesn't necessarily exist in sort of like, you know, uh, code that is put on, on Git, that is put on a file system somewhere where a HTTP server is started. This is just something that, that's like pushed straight into the cloud immediately as soon as you type. Um, if I type, you know, something slightly different, um, you know, that, that too is, uh, oops, that too is uh, live in production. You know, no no steps are involved, no CI CD, no servers, no provisioning, no no containers, etc. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit more of of a demo here. I'm going to 
uh, we'll, we'll change this to, uh, we'll change this to have a name. Uh, so let's, let's go open that. Hello, that doesn't exist anymore. Let's go to hello, Paul. There we go. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is just a quick little bit of sort of functional programming. Um, we are going to create a data store. Um, our data store is going to be called users. Uh, and users are going to have name, which is a string, and a date. And a date, which is a date. And we'll quickly create that user equals uh, name is user. And date is date now. Uh, and what you can see on the left here is you can see the actual values that we're using in production. So you can see John's story here made a request to that URL. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute, what, what, what that means. But for now, we are just going to store um, we, the things that are that are pure functional are executed and visible at any at any time. Things that are not. Uh, we, we can execute with this little little icon. And I'm just going to add this to the database. So we'll set user in the database. We'll use the key. Uh, I have overwritten that user val user. And the data store is users. And then let's quickly return. Um, we'll just return the count of, of users. So, DB count from the users table. Uh, and let's run this whole thing. So we can see now that the trace returns one, trace returns two, someone else must have pressed uh, refresh. So uh, I'll quickly open that. Uh, and then we can see uh, the thing records two and three and whatever. So, you know, roughly what we what we created here is in ve very quickly we created uh, a data store. We created um, a HTTP handler. All of these, you know, available live on the internet. Uh, and this is our sort of like built-in debugger of tracing. So it comes in with like observability and, and all that sort of thing, uh, which I will which I will talk about a little bit more um, a little bit more later. So. Get back to uh... okay. So um, now that you have a sort of a sense uh, of of what Dark is, I'm going to talk a little bit about these these sort of like built for the for the cloud features. So um, there are there are three kind of important uh, features, and we saw we saw all of them there. Uh, so just give me one moment to readjust things. Okay, um, and we saw uh, all of them there. So the first one of them is is what I call invisible infrastructure. So you can call, sort of think of this as serverless, but it goes a little bit on bit beyond serverless. With serverless, you're still thinking about you know we're running this HTTP server on a maybe a container, maybe maybe an app engine thing, or you know whatever. Um, but there's there's none of that here. There's just you write the code, you say where it lives, and it goes immediately. Um, into production. And so, you know, from the perspective of all this cloud native stuff, like there's none of this cloud native stuff uh, in it all. You don't need to think about queues or you don't need to think about, well, sorry, you don't need to think about like Kafka or you don't need to think about, oh, I'll piss on Kubernetes again because that's that's my least favorite thing. Um, and instead, we kind of write applications like this. So this is um, a full application that's written in dark that, you know, just receives events, sends an email, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple thing. Uh, users table, a cron job, the background worker, um, a HTTP request. Just like uh, you know, not not very complicated stuff. It's a not very complicated app, and what you get to see is essentially, you know, the essential complexity of, of what it takes to build this application. And if you were to try and build this in you know some other framework, you would probably spend the first hour trying to get it set up into production somehow. Um, 
uh, with you know Git repos, and you know, even if you took something simple like Heroku, you'd you know still going to be like. We need I'm sorry. No. Your audio, your audio is jumping in and out. Who's keeping that connection? Might be us. Might be us. Is it us? It's a. All right. I think it's you. He's, he's fine here. I refuse to believe that. I refuse to. Believe that. Yeah, it's fine now. Okay. Um, great. So, um, in in dark, uh, infrastructure is is instant and it's it's invisible. You never need to think about it. There's no provisioning. No you know, Terraform, infrastructure as code, there's no configuring, and most importantly, there's no waiting. Setting up data stores, setting up queues, workers, everything is just like right there to start. And the, the way we do that is that we're running this, you know, a multi-tenant system in the cloud with these data stores and, and, and everything um, running. So code lives in the cloud in a sense. This is kind of what I mean by, by there's a you know, a functional language for the cloud. There's no idea that you're creating a binary that runs on a computer somewhere. Um, obviously, you know, there are computers involved because that's that's how things go. There are there are servers and load balancers and, and all this sort of thing behind the scenes. Um, but you're never thinking about, you know, uh, a little bit of Git or, or you know, you're not, you know, even thinking about like the existence of a file system. Linux doesn't exist in the model of, um, of how you create software in dark. Um, I'm going to give you a little preview of, of something that we're working towards uh, in the future. This is sort of uh, a, a view of how we think software should be organized. Um, most of us today organize software in directories in a file system that we then put in repositories, uh, and then we have an organization of, of repositories. But when you think about how um, applications are, are like, if you think about when you start at a new job and you go talk to the senior or principal engineer or whatever, what happens is they take you to a whiteboard and they start to draw little diagrams of how the data flows around and, and what happens. And this is, I think, a better model for how, uh, for how we should think about our software. We shouldn't think about, you know, what are the files? What are the modules? We should instead think about like, you know, what is, what is connected? And this is a, a hypothetical um, view of, what you know a simple SaaS architecture would be like um, with a, a bunch of you know data stores and uh, and HTTP clients and, and some you know um, uh, monitoring of requests and, and that sort of thing. And this is sort of what we're trying to work towards getting away from the idea of software being text in files on disk on Linux or or, or whatever. So that was that was the invisible infrastructure. The um, the second idea uh, in dark is deployless, and that's that's what we call the the instant deployment. So whereas before we had the you know there's a CI CD system and it goes through many stages and runs many tests and that sort of thing, we've built dark from the ground up to be something that's that's safe to be able to deploy. So in dark, all you do is you make the change behind a feature flag. Um, any change that you want to make, you can make behind a feature flag, you can you can edit away, and then you can preview that change. You know, there's no need for like preview environments or that sort of thing. You can you can put that that behind a flag so that only you can see it or only your team can see it, or you know, depending on your particular deployment model that you prefer, maybe maybe it's something that that only a particular header can see, only a particular client, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you make that change be behind a feature flag, you know, you validate it however you need to be validated. Maybe it's a conversation with the rest of your team or whatever. And then that feature flag, you, you convert it to 10%, 50%, 100%. And this is sort of getting down that, that deploy to be um, just the, the minimal essential complexity, because sometimes you do want it to go out you know, very slowly and be able to like validate that it works. And sometimes, you know, you're just going to, you're just going to press the, the deploy button. You're just going to go straight into production. Who cares? And you can edit it live in production. Um, you know, I did there on the demo. Uh, most people we feel are going to prefer uh, feature flags. Um, and we have other set of deploy list features, uh, such as uh, such as database migrations and function versioning. Uh, every, uh, every function in Dark is versioned. Um, and that's just more ways of sort of having this immutable code 
so that you can be sure that when you're making changes, you know exactly what changes go out into production. And that's sort of the, the idea behind um, behind this deploy this list. Changes are instant. There's no uh, there's no deployment, no no GitHub, no no pull requests, that that sort of thing. Whatever you want um, can be can be built on top of that. Of course, um, if you need things like you know, permission to to deploy that can always be retrofitted into it. But the the idea of it is like, how do we get our deployments down to less than one second? In order to do that, you really have to design a language and a system from scratch to be able to do that. And, and that's exactly what we've done. So the third thing that I showed you. Well, So can we ask questions? Wait, questions? Yeah, uh, here, sure. uh, yeah. If it's a question about the content, uh, ask it. If it's a question about something else, come back later. Okay. Later. Later. Go on. Okay. So the last thing we saw um, is what, what we call trace-driven development. And trace-driven development is this idea that without instrumenting your code, without recompiling your code, you can get debugging access to, uh, to live values that your users have made of any uh, variable in your program. So you don't have to do, I mean, the, you know, the, the, there's two kinds of ways of doing debugging today. There's, there's a debugger and there's like printf debugging, and both of them suck in their own little ways. Um, Printf, you obviously have to have to recompile. You have to add it into the place. A debugger have their own problems. Generally, you have to restart it and get the condition back to where it's going to be. And both of these are kind of horrible. Um, and so what we do, and you, 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 you could see that a little bit when um, when I did the demo. Uh, this is this is some dark code here, and you can see that that the cursor is on the letter i. Uh, and so what we're showing or uh, on the variable i. And so what we show you in on the left is that 10 is the last value of i. And you can put your cursor anywhere and see what the result of that computation is. And uh, you can do that anywhere in the application. You also see the, the result of the whole thing, which is the at the bottom of the screen there, the one, two, fizz. Um, and so it's this idea that uh, you shouldn't need to do anything to be able to get this sort of amazing debugging ability. And the reason that we're able to do this is because we've brought everything together. We have, you know, we run the infrastructure, we run the editor, uh, we wrote the programming language, we wrote the runtime to enable this. So it's it's really like a, a, an incredibly powerful way, way to debug. And I miss this every day when I don't write dark. Um, can you show the trace? Like, a trace is kind of cut off. Uh, just at the end where it says this oh. trace returns, we can't see it. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so it just says this trace returns, and then it's a list. Um, uh, just like list syntax, open square bracket, one, two, th one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, close square bracket. Thank you. All right. So that's you know why we built Dark, what Dark is, kind of main features of Dark. But this is the the functional programming group. So let's let's talk about the the functional programming side of it. Um, Dark has all of these functional programming features. It is a functional programming language. Um, it has options and results as as the main you know error checking. There's there's no exceptions. There's no panics. Nothing like that. <laughs> Uh, it has strong static types, so everyone disagrees what strong really means in, in terms of type systems, but it's it's definitely on the strong side. Um, there, there's no cast coercions, and integer is not a float. Those are not the same thing. Uh, first class functions and immutable data. Um, it is expression-based, like most functional programming languages, uh, and it supports impure functions like, like some programming languages. So the, the sort of... I'll get back to you know specifically what what those are, but I want to talk about our influences a little bit because we are influenced by an awful lot of other programming languages. So Clojure was the first programming languages that I used an awful lot. Um, I'd I'd written some OCaml and some um, Haskell before that, but but Clojure was was really it, and struggled uh, with Clojure with knowing types, just knowing what could be the type of anything. This was in the pre-spec days, 
Um, and also, you know, just found nulls absolutely everywhere, and um, particularly because our database was was Mongo, and so there was, you know, really there could be any value at any point anywhere in your program, and it was a real challenge to to build software. So I really didn't, you know, I loved Closure, but I did really not like um, the statically type stuff or the lack of static types. And we experimented a bit with um, uh, typed Closure. Um, and funded that a little bit, but you know, that that project didn't really didn't really go anywhere. Even though we we used it for you know a couple of years in production. Um, the uh, Elm used quite a bit. The first version of the client was in Elm, so it's very similar to Elm um, in terms of like language features and and what you're doing in it. Uh, obviously, it doesn't have the architecture. Um, you know, not browser based um, and a little bit less pure. You 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 can do things like um, you know, call random number generator without passing the entire state through through the application. Uh, the original version of Dark was built in OCaml, um, and so it it grew alongside uh, our learning of OCaml. So it's kind of like OCaml with a little bit of better syntax um, and removing the sort of the bits of OCaml that no one really uses, like the object system and and, and that sort of thing, and just maybe a pure a more pure functional. Uh, version of it than OCaml. Uh, our front end is written in Rescript, so it's pretty similar to Rescript. No, no surprise because Rescript was OCaml minus all the stuff. Uh, and a little bit, I, I know Rust isn't really functional. Maybe we disagree on uh, on exactly how functional it is, but it's it's pretty similar to Rust in that there's options and results and there's records and there's enums and that sort of thing. Um, if Rust was uh, functional languages. Uh, higher, much higher level, uh, and of course, garbage collected, which is a super important, probably the most important feature in programming, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, for the F# -sharp people, it's like F# -sharp without without .NET or without you know C# -sharp interoperability. So looking at this code that that we saw earlier, um, you know, it it's generates a value, it puts it into a pipeline, it maps across it. There's expression-based uh, if statements, you know, very similar to what you expect in any, in any functional programming language. Um, so why, why did we do all these things? Well, static types, I firmly believe that static types are um, one of the easiest ways to reason and have correctness about your software. Knowing what the types are is often sufficient to know what the code is going to be. Um, and I have found that static types are not perfect at removing bugs from software, but they are probably the best tool that I'm aware of uh, for removing bugs from software. So static types was always going to be there. Uh, obviously, op options and results, we, we don't use the word monad uh, because it confuses users, but you know, there's this monadic kind of stuff in there uh, for class functions, expression-based. And then I think the most important one um, is uh, immutable data. I think immutable data is just, it just simplifies how we write software more than almost any other tool um, that we have. And it can be difficult to, to use immutable values all the time. You, you have to use folds instead of for loops and, and that sort of thing. But um, in terms of uh, in terms of writing software, I think it's like an essential feature, and I think it is the most important part, to my mind, of functional programming. Um, despite the fact that it's not, you know, it's not even in the name. It's it's not the thing that people think about most of the time. But for me, immutable data is is the thing that makes software easy to reason about. It is also the thing that allows traces. So those traces that we saw in the application. You know, most of those are not actually stored uh, during execution. We don't store anything that is an immutable expression. Anything that's a pure function doesn't need to get stored. We only store the results of the impure function. So if you're calling date now, if you're calling db fetch, that sort of thing, uh, we store those as part of traces in order to be able to uh, to debug later. Uh, but anything that's um, you know relies on this immutableness. Or we rely on this immutableness to be able to make that tracing system um, instant and um, uh, efficient, I suppose. Okay, so that's um, that's functional programming languages. Let's talk about uh, Dark's status. So Dark started 
in 2017 as this sort of like hot new startup, uh, you know, founder of Circle CI starts next thing, raised three and a half million, which 2017 was a reasonable seed round. 2021, that was a small seed round, but today, I guess that's big again. Um, but we did that for about for about three years, wrote a little bit of hype, and then things went bad. We we didn't manage to raise the Series A, hadn't got the product to a place where people were really able to um to use it very effectively. There was a lot of issues with it. Uh it was incomplete among among many, many other uh other problems. And so we, we kind of hit that oh shit moment where you know, even getting a little bit more money, we didn't have the money to keep going. Um, and so the the team went down to just me sort of trying to figure out how do we build this ambitious programming language slash platform slash editor um, in, you know, in the in the circumstances. So 2021 was spelt, it was spent on a rebuild, uh, removing a lot of technical debt on the back end, doing a rewrite from OCaml to F Sharp. And then 2022, we sort of refocused um, with the idea of like, build, we're, we're building for the community. We're building this thing that community can use um, and uh, focusing on how do we get a thing out there that, that becomes sort of like community owned in a sense. And then finally, of course, uh, 2023, uh, we are doing a secret new thing, which is not gonna be that much of a secret for too long because I'm gonna tell you in about 10 minutes. Um, but first, the 2021, this was the, the back-end rewrite. So uh, we, we had this initial version, which was written in OCaml. Actually, the initial version was, was written in Python, but that lasted for about 800 lines before I discovered I couldn't really refactor anything. So that got rewritten to OCaml. And then until 2020, it was, uh, it was OCaml. We considered going to Rust. I did a, I did a, um, uh, spent a couple of months like evaluating Rust and see whether that would be a better place to to write in. We had spent several years when we were building on OCaml saying when we do the Rust rewrite, we'll do this properly and this properly and this properly. And so basically, I was evaluating, you know, is this going to be fast enough? Is this going to be like fast enough to to write, not just performance, but but what is it like to write code in in Rust? And determined that I did not like it. I like functional programming languages, and it is not one of them. Um, so instead ended up going to F sharp. Um, so not as performance as OCaml, but much better ecosystem, a lot more tools, a lot more libraries, a lot more SDKs, purely because those things exist in the .NET ecosystem um, and they do not in, in a lot of other ecosystems. So I spent what I thought was gonna be six months, ended up being 20 months uh, on this rewrite, which uh, went out in uh, July of 2022. Um, and it went out pretty much bug for bug compatible. So all of our existing users um, were, you know, the part of the thing about Dark and part of this like deploy this idea uh, is that applications should never change. So we should never break uh, people's, you know, our our users' code in a, you know, kind of in the way that that often happens when libraries or when um, uh, programming environments upgrade, you know, Python 2 to Python 3 broke everybody, broke the entire ecosystem for a decade. Um, that's not the sort of thing that we want. So it went out bug for bug compatible, which may have been, may have been a choice, may have, it certainly was a choice, may have been a good choice, hard to say. Um, okay, so F sharp, is it good? Yes, loved F sharp. So compared to um, compared to Rust, Rust, you know, it's it's not immutable. It's not an immutable language. It's a very low-level language. There's no GC, um, and it doesn't really have the libraries for immutability that we needed for um, for Dark. In particular, it didn't have you know built-in garbage collection. Uh, so writing in Rust would have meant that we would have had to build that immutability. Some of it was there, but not not that much. It's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to do async and recursion in. Uh, at the same time in Rust, but F Sharp has no problem with it at all. Um, the our experience with F Sharp has been has been pretty excellent. It is slow to compile, uh, especially relative to, to OCaml. Um, that is probably the biggest weakness in the um, uh, in F Sharp, which is to say, actually maybe maybe it's its only weakness. 
Um, I don't find the, the .NET web stack to be particularly interesting because it's kind of written for, for C Sharp. It's, a, it's confusing, this ASP.NET kind of shit. But there are functional wrappers built on top of it, which, which we don't use, which is, um, you know, for better or worse. It's, um, the other thing about F-Sharp is that it's built on top of .NET. I have always been a, you know, in the Linux ecosystem. I've never been a .NET uh, programmer, but I joined in the, you know, the .NET rewrite where it's dot, it's called .NET, well, six, seven now, um, but it was called .NET Core and it's sort of a grand up rewrite of, of F-Sharp. And honestly, that has been, that has been amazing. The ecosystem is phenomenal. The tools uh, get faster all the time and the language gets faster. Um, We've been really happy with with the .NET stuff and really happy with F Sharp. So, our future with Dark, you know, what what we're kind of thinking of over, um, uh, or what we're doing with the language over the next few years, we're focusing on this sort of idea of how do we keep Dark being sustainable since it's not, you know, hot new startup anymore. It's this. Uh, this new way of programming that we want to exist in the world and that we want to exist in the world for the long term. How do we do that? Well, part of the stuff that we're doing is we're building in public. Uh, we're, we're trying to empower contributors to, to help everything. Everything is public. All the code is public. The, there's a discord, which is where we do all of our communication. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's dark has a uh, total of three employees now, but every employee stuff happens in the discord channel. Um, so we're really trying to, to blur the line between sort of employee and contributor so that people who build things on Dark can feel empowered to, to you know, solve their problems if they exist within, you know, the Dark runtime, within the Dark standard library, et cetera. And of course, adding a package manager so that they can, you know, create their own packages and, and, and share them with the, with the ecosystem. We are for the first time uh, rolling out sponsorship. So you can go to darkline.com slash sponsor. I think we have $0 now since I told nobody about it and only put it up at the weekend, but that's something that we'll be announcing to our um, to our community in um, uh, in uh, probably, probably tomorrow. I might write that email tomorrow. Um, so one last thing to talk about before we're done, and that is the new secret thing. So I say, please be cool. I honestly don't think that uh, that dark is interesting enough for, uh, to the world for for uh, all of you to to share it on Twitter um, and for people to be to be super interested about that. But the reason I'm saying please be cool is that uh, this is an area that people are a little bit iffy about. Uh, they're not super sure uh, about it, and uh, you know, it'd be interesting to gauge your reaction, but. What it is, is that we are going to integrate Dark with a GPT-based system, uh, not necessarily ChatGPT. I see some reactions here. This is this is interesting. Not necessarily ChatGPT, but I'm going to use ChatGPT as a placeholder for some LLM GPT-based system. Um, and sort of the question, you know, the reason that we're, that we're I was going to say looking at this, but really we're looking like very aggressively at this. This is, this is all that we're spending on, our time on now. Um, is that you know from using Copilot and looking at ChatGPT and looking at how it generates code, I'm you know kind of wondering we're building this system for writing code and we're a couple of years away from it being really good and you know taking over the world if it does that, but like in three years or five years are people really going to be writing artisanal code? Are we are we going to be typing on our on our keyboards? Uh, to put the code out there, and I'm not super sure that we are. Uh, stuff that I've seen from ChatGPT and my own experiments, my own use as a copilot, has made me think like, hmm, this is like this is the first version of it. You know, there's going to be more versions of this, and people are using it. We are using it uh, to write code, and obviously, there's a lot of problems with, you know, where did this model come from, and and all that sort of thing, and. You know, it's it's a liar and it's you know manufactures or hallucinates things and you know writes in the style of a 12 year old but it's very good at writing code um you ask it to write code and it does it um and that's a very interesting thing if we're writing software that is intended to reduce accidental complexity so we are going we're going all in on this we we are gonna have a system where uh, you tell ChatGPT what you want, and it builds it 
live in production. So taking advantage of, of darks, you know, liveness and, and all that sort of thing. Um, all the trace driven development and things that can be fed back into the model. Uh, I think it's going to be quite interesting relative to, to you know, just talking to ChatGPT, but we are super early um, and there's there's a lot lot to go with this. And you kind of don't know where this is going to go, but uh, we are we are kind of all in. So uh, that is that is kind of everything. That's you know why we built it, demo, functional programming bit of it, and the the new secret exciting thing that uh, um, that is spending that I'm spending an awful awful lot of time thinking about these days. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we will open things up to questions that we already got a hand on. So, so the thing I'm wondering is since you don't have kids at Deco, you don't, but you don't have a word in the swap that's only going to keep track of every single function good. Can you explain how you keep track of both things and how you roll back when you produce, when you have a code, you put it in the back of it? No, I don't want to go back to the old one. But all Sorry, I'm I'm having trouble I'm having trouble making out the the question. I wonder if you could slow it down a, a little bit. The audio is not great in in your room. Conversion control. How can we roll back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, so how how do we roll back? Yeah. So you know the you press Command Z, um, and then it is roll back. You know it's it's it becomes undo, um, is is the obvious thing, um. We we don't have a more robust um, uh, version control system right now, which is one of the reasons that you know it hasn't taken off. Um, but the conceptually, every every change that you make to dark programs is is an operation. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with with CRDTs or, or operational transforms, um, but you know it, it's it's just uh, a list of changes that you have made. So you can go back to the previous change and the previous change and the previous change. And our, our observation is that like people don't really do um, do this in practice. You know, people tend to do an awful lot of rolling forward instead. Um, but you know, if you want to roll back, there's there's no reason that you can't. Um, you just make another you know feature flag, or or you know at the moment you literally press just like Command Z, and then you're back to the old version. So so can I follow up on that? So so you're sort of centralized version control um you asked are we reinventing centralized version control you're rejecting it right? we, we are no 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 we are uh, I, I suppose you would say we are reimagining it um what, what we're doing is uh we're saying so dark is is uh an ast based language there's no text stored anywhere so basically the the Change, all changes that are made to dark are essentially diffs to the code. Um, and so we are putting the version control within the editor uh, where it sort of you know where it sort of belongs because it doesn't make any sense to have this separate git system, this you know file based system on top of dark. So honestly it's going to work pretty similar to most people's git workflows. Obviously it's not going to be a distributed, um, version control system, but you know, there's there's going to be branches that are uh, in, in effect that there already are. But we use we use feature flags for for all these things. So you can just make you know a branch is a feature flag. Um, get getting rid of that branch is deleting the feature flag. Merging the branch is merging the or is is making the feature flag the default. And going back to it is going through the undo stack to find um, you know where that was merged and to and to go back to it. I think this might be might be me now. Uh, first, uh, Paul, thank you for this. is very is very interesting. Uh, just a quick comment. This actually a lot of the things you're saying remind me of uh, what I've also seen in a language called Unison. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you if you're unfamiliar with that, you might want to Google it. Uh, two quick questions for you. Uh, the first is um, this seems very interesting and uh, a superpower for uh, small scale. So a single developer or maybe a pair of developers who sit together who want to crank something out quickly. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how a larger scale team uh, might collaboratively produce something uh, in this system. That's question number one. And then question number two is, uh, 
in my experience, uh, a lot of complexity for systems that makes it hard to understand their state or to debug them actually happens over time. It's the change of the system over time, uh, especially in the context of persisted state uh, in your data store. Uh, so without having a clear Git-like history, uh, what are you doing to enable someone or a group of people to be able to debug and understand the current state by understanding the changes to the system over time? Yeah, um, really good questions. So I, I, I will go, I will go uh, backwards um, because that's how my memory works. Uh, so, you know, what, what are we doing about sort of like, you know, being the system of record for, for how code, like the archaeology of code. Um, and so we, you know, we, we are, you know, just just to restate, we we do we are building version control. Um, you know, I I say that that the uh you know a feature flag being merged is essentially equivalent to a pull request, but that means that in order to have a feature flag merged, you know, you need you need a comments box, you need a discussion, you need a back and forth, you need you need the code changes that are happening within that pull request to be to be part of the system. So. It, one of the things that that we observed about how software is being built is um, the we'll call, we'll call it comments, right? Comments are everywhere. Comments are in uh, Git commits. They're in pull requests. They're obviously in the code, but they're also in Slack. They're in Trello. They're in you know Jira. Uh, they're in email. All that sort of thing. So we we want you know thinking big for the future. Uh, we we want a system where we actually have that entire history built into um, into Dart in some way, so that any change that is made has that sort of like archaeology um, based into it. Um, and we are very much thinking about um, Dart as a sort of uh, as a project or as a as a tool for big uh, for big companies for big users. Um, it is it is not good for that use case today, but a lot of the things that we are we're designing about so like deploy list for example, um, you know we're, we're, we're the the features the essential features of it things like uh, database migrations and feature flags are sort of like a best practice that are used by larger teams more than they are used by small teams. Um, but we're building all of our stuff on top of those because those are the really powerful ways um, of building. Um, of building the sort of like systems, regardless of whether you're you're a small team or a large team. So we, we are very much focusing on that. Um, the you also asked about uh, about Unison. Um, uh, no, no, I, I made a comment that this a lot of the concepts remind me of concepts that are also explored in Unison. The, right. the first question was. Uh, this this seems like a superpower for development uh, for maybe an individual trying to crank something out quickly, uh, but a lot of software in industry is built by large teams that are distributed and work on different parts of the system at the same time. Uh, so I'm curious, like, what are you doing to kind of make that reasonable uh, in, gotcha, in this kind gotcha. of world? Um, well, I think I accidentally answered that in, in part of my first one. It's, uh, you know, if you, the we, we, we are using sort of, you know, the tools. We, we generally don't like to reinvent too much. Like we're doing a lot of reinventing in kind of the core things, but beyond that, these things are like well solved. You know, the um, using things like um, uh, you know teams organized into separate repos, into separate um, uh, groups, separate permission structures, that sort of thing. You know, there's there's no reason that stuff can't exist within Dark. Um, you know, even even if the default is that you can you can instantly deploy. You know, obviously that doesn't work for a larger team, um, and you need you need features like you know the permission of of you know two code reviews or something like that in order to go out. There's there's no reason that that can't be backfilled into um, into Dark as it exists today. Uh, only difference being the the merge button um, doesn't you know kick off a pipeline that puts a container into et cetera et cetera et cetera. Um, I will comment on the Unison thing, though. Uh, so very familiar with Unison, have been have been following their project since you know about 2017. Um, one of the interesting things about Unison is um, this sort of uh, content, uh, what's it called, content addressed hashes or, or you know, functions. Um, the we have a thing called function versioning, which um, is sort of similar. Uh, when combined with this other feature we have, which is called locking, which I didn't really get into. But basically, when you have code in production, um, it locks and it can only be changed by making feature flags. And that's to sort of have this safe thing. And 
if you version things and lock them, then it's essentially the same as content addressed um, functions. Um, but we do have sort of the same problem that you get from content address functions, which is that when you are changing something that calls it or something that calls it or something that calls it the whole way down, um, you have to, you know, ch change some, you have to change the whole stack. And so that, that is actually how it's not exactly how it works now in dark, but how it is going to work in dark. Um, that if you want to put a feature flag, that's like three steps in that creates a whole call stack of new functions. Um, which, which is fine, you know, these, th that is, that is sort of how it's supposed to work. We don't want, we specifically don't want to break any existing stuff in production. Things should only break by deliberate changes that were chosen to be merged. Um, so regardless of whether those are, those are instantly merged, um, you know, the, we, we want that to be true. And going back to your question about like large teams, we think this is a feature that is especially beneficial for large teams. Because if you go make a change in existing function in a large code base, you have a very small chance of like understanding what the ramifications of that are in term in services that you, you know, aren't intimately familiar with. So we, we don't want people to, you know, be changing foundational libraries or, you know, the utils package and suddenly everything is broken. Um, we want people to make a new version of that function that has that bug fix. And we want then all the teams to choose to opt into that. We have a deprecation system built in uh, so that we alert you when things are deprecated and, and so on. Okay, um, John, a question. Uh, yes. Sorry, so John. I, oh, John. Uh, our yep. Yeah. So just real quick, this sounds like it's gonna cost me a lot of money. <laughs> if I wanted to run an app, a big application on this, like, how are you going to charge me? How do I know how much I'm going to have to pay for it? Ooh, good question. Well, you know, the, the obvious answer is that that it is, you know, several years away from being suitable for for uh, a large applications. But we'll we'll go with the theoretical answer instead. Um, our our intent is uh, that it should cost you know roughly double what it would cost to build yourself. So if you were running yourself something written in, you know, Node or Go or something like that, um, it, it shouldn't cost significantly more. You know, obviously there, there's a premium, uh, but not, you know, not a 10x premium. Um, and part of the ways that we that we intend to do that um, is that because we, we kind of have control over the system, we are responsible for the optimization of the system. So... Um, you know, if you want to lower the amount of observability that's happening, you should be able to do that yourself um, to, to save costs. But, you know, if you want it to go faster or to be stored in a more appropriate data store uh, for your use case, that's something that we want to own ourselves. Um, and we want to, you know, kind of optimize the running systems. But again, uh, we're, we're a lot of years out on, on that. Okay, uh, John Story. Thank you. Well, John Kavnar asked my main question because um, I looked at this and I just said, yeah, that's going to cost money to deploy. It's scale. Uh, but I do have some other questions. Where are you? I, I went through your Mastodon profile, by the way. Congratulations on being Irish. Wise choice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wonderful. And, 1100, and you follow 1,100 people? Do you actually read that thing? <laughs> that's impossible. Yeah. So uh, no, it's a nightmare. What I did when I signed up was I, I followed all my followers. Uh, and so now I have way too many people to follow. And yeah, I don't, the content's really good though. So like I, I, I unfollowed boring people and now I'm still left with this. So I don't know, I don't know what I'm gonna do about it. Okay. Um, I think your answer to my first question was embedded in your previous uh, answer, which is you're probably not looking to let people deploy this on tram, are you? That's right. That's right. So it's it's very much designed as a system that we are running, um, and in particular, um, wh when we think about this, you know, the the sort of like upgrading the language and standard libraries and and you know the the on disk representation and all the things that we don't want you to think about, um, we uh, it is sort of predicated on this idea that all dark code runs on our servers and all dark code is stored in our databases. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that like is, uh, the, 
the concept, I suppose, of dark is that that we draw a big circle around things that, that we call accidental complexity. So, you know, everything from, you know, running the pager um, to, uh, you know, database upgrades and, and whatever else. You know, we, we don't want someone using dark, their first experience to be like, oh, now install Kubernetes and then you can deploy this or, you know, get this deployed somewhere and then you, you can start to build. It's very much designed around we run this for you um, and you know you don't have to think about all the other stuff which we are broadly calling accidental complexity and apologies to people who have you know devops or ops in their job title who i'm sort of calling accidental complexity here um the, I, uh, understand. I understand this the, the corrupt yeah. on that side thank you <laughs> yeah we, we, we've we've had this criticism before um but uh yeah, yeah. We, we we want we want that to like be reduced to, to near zero, most of it by the design of the system, but a lot of it by just like we run it for you. Okay, and my second question, and I, I, I think I can infer it from the timeline of the project. Um, so there are going to be people who want this system badly, mm -hmm. but could care less about dark and we're going to use a transpiler from something they're more familiar with, that they write it back in from fables like UF Sharp, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Is, there, is there any thought towards a future set of plugins where they can plug that type of functionality in? Um, no, 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 not, not really. Um, the, we're not really intending for this to be the system that people use with something else. Um, there are, um, it, it's sort of designed in a way that like, you know, th there are observability startups out there. You know, if you want observability, you can, you can use, Honeycomb's automatic um, instrumentation or something like that. There are hosting companies out there. If you want a serverless.net um, or serverless F sharp or serverless OCaml, you know, that's that's relatively straightforward with you know a couple of hours of DevOps, but then you have it. Um, so we are we are not interested in being, you know, one of those things. We we are interested in what happens when you enable all of this. And how do we get like this radical simplicity, which I believe comes from the fact that it is an integrated language editor and platform. Um, and a lot of that stuff like trace driven developments, like, you know, theoretically you could take, you know, your observability stack, hook it up to your VS code stack, hook it up to your language plugin and runtime and that sort of thing. And that sounds like a total nightmare. And one of the reasons that we're not yeah, building that true. as our startup. <laughs> Um, but also, I, I, you know, I think that's that's fundamentally hard. It's 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 you know actually building that as a technology would be incredibly difficult. Whereas what we do is we write an interpreter, um, and we run the interpreter in the cloud, and we compile the interpreter to your browser, and you know that's hard enough as it is. That's an awful lot of work. Um, so, um, yeah, not not looking at doing it for for kind of other stacks or or that sort of thing. Thank you. All right, there's a hand up in the in the room, I guess. Peter. Yes. Yeah. Peter. All right. Number one, I've seen the dystopian future that is service meshes. And I've also had the Helm deployment 800 kilobyte state file. I haven't figured it out, by the way. So if anyone wants to help me with that, I think the deal is I delete the secret, which will then maybe solve the problem or destroy our deployment. <laughs> it will do one of those. Things. All right. So that's where I'm coming from. I like this. I will just tell you, I was trying to figure out where this fits. And I'm just going to tell you, you're going to hate this or love it. In your program, uh, programming language, ABA2, and integrate it with the uh, ERP, like SAP. This is, this is incredible. SAP is so hard. And this, like, you don't have to worry about scale because they're already paying through the nose. Like whatever, anyway, I'm just going out there, just, I, there's no question, by the way. So right, right. next person. Well, yeah, the, the idea, the idea, let's, let's, you know, attach it to something like SAP or something that's ridiculously expensive. It, it has occurred to us. Um, we, we are still in the, you know, making this good phase. Um, I know, you know, SAP probably isn't good anyway, so it's probably fine. But uh, we we are focused on on the lower end of the market right now until it's good. Better than writing Java. It, it does sound like a 
this business opportunity, just attach to SAP, you don't have to make it good. Or <laughs> equivalent, a sales force. I hear the sales force a lot of these things. I don't know what it means. <laughs> okay, so I, I want to jump in here. Um, and sort of all these different features of, you know, programming, so the editor, the version control, all this kind of stuff. And, and one thing it makes me think about Richard Kim wrote SQLite, but also has this fossil version control that kind of integrates everything. So it's total tickets and then it's with it has tech notes, which I don't understand what they are, and all these so we're, we're, things. We're having, we're having audio issues. I can see it in the face of the other people on the Zoom call. Um, strugg struggling to hear the question. Yeah. Are, are we back yet? You just got to stand by the mic. Yeah, you just gotta I just got to stand by the mic. For Jack, I yeah. Like you're, you're I taking a class. Okay. Okay. Was. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. So, you were talking about sort of integrating multiple elements of programming. So, the version control, editor, all this kind of thing. And I'm wondering about where do you draw the circle of what should be integrated and what shouldn't? Mm -hmm. Um, where we draw the circle of what should be integrated and uh, or what should be integrated and what shouldn't. Um, so I actually have a graphic for this, which I did not put in the presentation. Um, but the, the, the idea is sort of like, you know, as much as possible. If, if there's something that you define or that, that, that could reasonably be called accidental complexity for building applications, then it goes in the circle. And that, that at least is sort of the big vision of, of dark, the, the sort of, you know, uh, cut down vision, you know, means that that at some point we may need to to compromise that in a bunch of ways. Um, but you know, when you know, presumably dark takes off at some point, and and then we we have revenue and and you know, funding and a team and, and you know all that all that sort of thing. Then yeah, we're, we're you know we're planning on on everything from like security and ops and and uh, you know the uh, everything to sort of live here. Um, and that really all you need to think about is is the code. And the um we if you sort of like look at no code startups, we 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 think we're in this sort of like adjacent space, which we call just code, uh, where no code allowed you build applications with without thinking about the deployments, without thinking about the hosting, without thinking about like all this sort of thing. And we we you know think code is fundamental to writing applications, but we think they have it right that you shouldn't have to think about like all that sort of thing. And that should be, you know, part of what you paid for. You know, there, there was a question earlier, um, is this going to be really expensive? Well, you know, presumably it's going to be expensive, but also, you know, you're going to be able to do, well, you know, to have half the team or, you know, hopefully build twice as much with the team that you that you already have. Uh, John has uh, his hand up, I believe. Yes. So. It always strikes me as, is, well, two things. One is a lot of what you're calling accidental complexity is unfortunately evil, deliberate complexity. So, sure, sure, sure. Rid of that. <laughs> um, but it also reminds me very much of the experience that I had in 1981 writing BASIC, like on a mainframe, you know? Mm -hmm. It it better traceability. I'll give you that. Otherwise, it's very much the same thing. Which I don't know what that means, but that's you know. There you go. Um, in, in, in the sense that that you know before you had this like giant mess to get systems out, and all of a sudden you had this you know interpreted language I that got a I had to write code and it tells me what it does. And right. It, right. You know, it was a huge advantage over punch cards. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. And honestly, uh, compared to what I live with today, this stuff sounds like almost as much of an advantage over what I have to deal with today, which early today was debugging a PowerShell script that somebody had inadvertently messed up that 
broke everybody's compilation process in my entire company. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know. in, in the in the um, basic uh, metaphor, your CI CD system was was the punch cards compilation process that took hours and was asynchronous and and instead you just got to type code straight into the oh, I, I I I can see that. That's that's a very similar I mean, kind of thing. I have been before you were born, but you know. Um, you said 81? Uh, my script didn't. Yeah. Um so I, I'm gonna make a little comment about the large language models. Um mm -hmm. I'm going to assert that the only thing they can actually produce is bullshit. And what wow. I mean by that is, I don't know, 15 years ago, I read a book by a Harvard professor uh, who's a philosopher. It was called On Bullshit. And the basic point of the book was that like a liar knows the truth and is trying to hide it. Somebody who's telling you the truth is trying to tell the truth, but somebody who's bullshitting is just telling you something and they don't care about the truth. And mm -hmm. large language models have no concept of truth. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, it is the, if you get a better large language model, it's just a better bullshit. But I'll just keep that. <laughs> yeah, so the I, I'll, I'll tell you why why I sort of well, so, you know, fundamentally, I agree with that, right? They're they're just text predictors, um, and they. Uh, yeah, they, they they lie, they hallucinate, you know, they, they, they do all sorts of things. It's easy to trick them, you know. Um, but I, I think that empirically, they have been good at generating code. Um, and, you know, even if the code is a lie, uh, you know, even if it's like, you know, doesn't do what it says in the tin, it is, it is an interactive process with a human and the code itself runs a little bit later. Now, I think that there is a future where, you know, the the AI, you know, has the state stored in the database itself, and we're in like an open AI runtime where we speak to it, and you know, sort of like talking to the Star Trek computer. But we are we are a long way from from that, and uh, like purely from a technical perspective, but also obviously from a, you know, you want your your thing to not be a bullshitter. But I think the fact that it's a bullshitter today um, is actually fine for the use case of writing code. And I think that, that you know, my own playing with it, it's like, you know, code, it generates code that kind of mostly works, which is, you know, a lot like copying from Stack Overflow, which is what most of us do for writing code. So it's not, um, like, do, do I think that we're gonna just deploy immediately the sort of chat GPT thing? No, we, we, we need safety. And, you know, that, that's built into like, to the, to the dark deployment model, right? You know, there's feature flags and code reviews and you know, that sort of things built into the idea. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, one, it's gonna, it's good enough. And two, that it's that it's only gonna get better. And maybe better is is still lies or bullshitting, but it is also like working code. So okay. so, Mark, so on that note, I, I wanna um Thank you. I want to stop the recording and then we will go into our non-recorded uh, Q&A, which is often a little more lively. Uh, people are a little less restrained, um, but this was this was so super interesting and, and super great and um, really, yeah, just really interesting and fascinating. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And now I'm going to figure out how to stop the recording.